Paul Joseph Watson. Communism killed 94 million people. Communism killed at least 90 million people. 190 million dead from communism in the last century alone. Communism only killed about 100 million people. Communism slash socialism has killed 100 million people. Jordan B. Peterson. Communism killed between 85 and 100 million. Communism is the cause of 100 million deaths at minimum, as many as 200 million people, innocent men, women, and children, may have been killed because of communism. Charlie Kirk Socialism has killed 60 million people in the last 100 years. Over 100 million people killed and countless lives shattered by socialism. Communism and socialism killed over 100 million people in the last 100 years. Over 110 million civilians killed in the last 100 years thanks to Marxism. Socialism killed over 150 million people in the last 100 years. <sighs> okay. If you've ever been online and publicly advocated for socialism, or basic access to healthcare, or said that you're not a Republican, or even just wish someone a happy Hanukkah, you've probably been told by some stranger on the internet that communism has already been tried, and that it killed 100 million people. Countless articles, opinion pieces, books, lectures, and organizations have been written or created in order to argue this point. But are they correct? I don't think so, and today we'll be refuting the communism killed 100 million people argument, and once and for all finally put to the rest one of the most popular arguments used against socialism. The origins of this 100 million dead estimate is the Black Book of Communism, a 1997 compendium of estimates by various French historians collected and expanded upon by Professor Stéphane Courtois. The book breaks down 20 million killed in the Soviet Union, 65 million killed in Mao's China, 1 million killed by Ho Chi Minh's Vietnam, 2 million dead in North Korea, 2 million killed by Pol Pot, 1.7 million killed in Africa, and 1.5 million killed in Afghanistan. These estimates add up to about 94 million, with 100 million being rounded up to. Now, this book has many problems, many of which have been pointed out by even its own authors. Two of these authors, Nicholas Wirth and John Louis Margolin, who wrote the sections of the book criticizing the Soviet Union and East Asian governments respectively, have both criticized the main author, Stéphane Courtois, for what they themselves describe as historical approximations, contradictions, and clumsiness, along with, quote, his obsession with reaching a number of a hundred million dead, unquote. As his willingness to twist numbers to that effect, Worth has criticized Courtois for adding five million dead for his total of the Soviet Union without explanation, and Margolin has criticized Courtois for saying that one million Vietnamese were killed by Ho Chi Minh, something that Margolin claims he never reported. These, along with other historians' criticisms, have led Harvard University Press, who published the book in America, to distance themselves from the book, and admit that it contains, in their own words, remedial math errors, and to stop supporting it. Now, because the vast majority of this 94 million estimate comes from Mao's China and Stalin's Soviet Union, the vast majority of this video will be spent on these entries, and because I will try to show that you don't need to be a socialist to reject the 100 million dead number, the majority of historians I will quote today will be capitalists. Some communists may not like that I'll be quoting predominantly capitalists, and may believe that this will lead to unfair criticisms of socialist governments, but I believe that this can help show that even with capitalist estimates, these numbers are absurd. Now, with that said, let's begin. Part 1. Joseph Stalin and the Soviet Union The Black Book's chapter on the Soviet Union, as well as the ones on Eastern Europe, have many historical errors, with many of them being pointed out by Hungarian historian of Eastern Europe, Peter Knez, for example, on page 42, Worth claims that the Austro-Hungarian Empire conquered Poland in 1915, when in reality it was the German Empire. On page 48, he quotes a letter from Vladimir Lenin to Alexander Shlipnikov, dated the 17th of October, 1917, a date which is impossible due to the fact that the letter talks about the need to overthrow the Tsar, who had already abdicated the throne on March 17th of 1917. He gives the number of Bolsheviks in October 1917 as only 2,000, when in reality it was in the tens of thousands, if not hundreds of thousands. He describes the provisional Kerensky government as elected, when in fact it was appointed. He even says that the peasant revolts hurt the Red Army more than the White Army, even though the peasants were far more likely to side with the Bolsheviks than the Whites. Knez also criticizes the author on the chapters of Eastern European Communism for saying on page 364 that, in the summer of 1920, Lenin launched a Red Army offensive against Warsaw, when in actuality it was Poland, under the leadership of Joseph Pilzudinski, probably mispronouncing that, 
that attacked the Red Army, not the other way around. But we're not here for just any old historical inaccuracies. We're here for inaccuracies relating specifically to the death toll of the Soviet Union, a supposed 15 to 20 million people. So let's get into the brief history of Sovietology and the origins of many of these high death tolls, and how historians' death estimates have changed over time. Our understanding of the Soviet Union during the Cold War changed with political circumstances. During World War II, for instance, when we were allied with Stalin, generally favorable books were published in the West about him. Think J.T. Murphy's book Stalin, 1879-1944. After the end of World War II, and during the beginnings of the Cold War, our portrait of the Soviet Union became decidedly more negative. This general attitude of hostility made it easier for less than credible estimates to become mainstream. By far the most famous of these comes from Russian dissident and Gulag prisoner Alexander Solzhenitsyn. His main work, The Gulag Archipelago, has been read by millions of people, and recently received an introduction by no less a figure than Jordan B. Peterson himself. Solzhenitsyn's work is, to put it mildly, not credible. He estimates that 66 million people died under the Soviet Union, about one-third of the entire population, an estimate which is virtually mathematically impossible, considering that life expectancy more than doubled from the early 1900s to 1959. Not only that, Solzhenitsyn has received a large amount of criticism in recent years for his outlandish views on the world and history in general. His avowed anti-Semitism is just one example. Even Richard Pipes, the incredibly conservative historian who was sympathetic to Solzhenitsyn, wrote that he was, quote, unquestionably in the grip of the Russian extreme right's view on the Russian Revolution, which is that it was the doing of the Jews. Outside of this, his open support and admiration for right-wing dictatorship is well documented. He visited Spain and praised Franco, the Hitler-aligned fascist dictator, and endorsed Suharto, the Indonesian leader whose purges and killings of ethnic minorities is considered to be one of the largest genocides since the Holocaust. Even his wife was perplexed by his overwhelming support in the West. Quoting the New York Times, In her 1974 memoir, Sonia, My Life with Alexander Solzhenitsyn, she wrote that she was perplexed that the West had accepted the Gulag Archipelago as the solemn, ultimate truth, saying its significance had been overestimated and wrongly appraised. Pointing out the book's subtitle is An Experiment in Literary Investigation, she said that her husband did not regard the work as historical research or scientific research. She contended it was, rather, a collection of camp folklore, containing raw material, which her husband was planning to use in his future projects. But in spite of the fact that he put forward absurd estimates, had outlandish views and wrote, under his own wife's admission, largely fiction, Solzhenitsyn is still the world's most famous anti-communist, and is greatly respected in the Western world. Now, in terms of academia, the most influential Sovietologist in the Western world during the Cold War was Robert Conquest, who wrote the wildly influential books The Great Terror and The Harvest of Sorrow in 1968 and 1986, which estimated 20 million dead under Stalin, the estimate the Black Book uses. Conquest was a member of the British Information Research Department, an anti-Soviet propaganda offensive created by the British government to oppose the Soviet Union. During the beginning of the Cold War, during McCarthyism and the Cuban Missile Crisis, histories of the Soviet Union tended to be very right-wing, and it is during this period more than any other that it is responsible for the popular American 1984-esque tens of millions dead view of the Soviet Union. I say American because much of the world, including many ex-communist countries, do not share this view. As time went on and the Cold War thawed, new interpretations and estimates began to be put forward. We now have access to the Soviet archives, and are now able to revise our previous death tolls for the Soviet Union. Now, I'm sure some of my viewers are against the idea of using government archives. After all, these archives were gathered by the Soviet Union itself. Why should we trust them to give us reliable estimates and to accurately detail their own crimes? Well, for one, archives are almost always used to better understand governments. One of the main reasons we are able to understand so much about the Nazi Empire is because of the amounts of archives we are able to rescue. Secondly, historians don't just blindly parrot what the archives say. Historians are able, and willing, to expand on them and find places where a government might be lying or underestimating. But this doesn't change the fact that the archives are fundamentally important to understanding death tolls. They've changed the way we look at the Soviet Union. Because, as that guy from Austin Powers once said, the Cold War is over. The world is no longer being held hostage by the threat of nuclear war. Capitalism, and by extension the United States, is no longer under serious threat by a powerful, militant socialist nation. Passions have died down, and this, as well as us having access to the Soviet Union's archives, have allowed us to begin a slightly more objective analysis of the Soviet Union.
And what have we found? Put simply, conquest was wrong. As time has gone on, the estimates of the number killed in the Soviet Union have gone down considerably. So, with all that history out of the way, let's finally get into those estimates. Part A. The Gulags One of the first things to be revised by our access to the archives were our ideas about the Gulags. While scholarship tended to view them as a tight-knit system where mostly political dissidents were sent to language for decades, it turns out that the Gulags were more dynamic than that. Keep in mind that dynamic doesn't necessarily mean good. We now know that the sizable majority of Gulag prisoners were sent there for non-political crimes, with percentages averaging around 30% of people being sent there for political crimes every year. We also now know that the Gulags were a very liquid system, with people constantly entering and leaving, with an average of between 20-40% to 40 of prisoners being released every year. These prisoners would often end up right back in the Gulags as a result of the very high recidivism rate, leading to 18 million prisoners over the history of the Gulags. So how many people actually died in the Gulags? Well, within the archives, we actually have an exact number for this, at least over a certain period. 1,053,829 people died in the years 1934 to 1953, these being the main years the Gulags were active. However, this only counts those that died in the Gulags. The Soviet Union had a habit of taking people who were close to death and releasing them, with many of these people dying shortly after. These deaths, to me at least, should be counted, because they would not have died without being Gulag prisoners in the first place. When accounting for these deaths, the consensus of historians, be they liberals, conservatives, socialists, or capitalists, is that between 1.5 and 1.7 million people died as a result of the Gulags. This is a good example of what I said about earlier, about historians listening to and learning from the archives, but not just taking their word for it. It should be noted, however, that the majority of those who died in the Gulags died in just five years, 1941 to 1945, the years of the Nazi invasion. 59% of all those who died in the Gulags died during World War II. The average death rate for the Gulags before World War II was 4.4% per year, with the deadliest year being 1938, the final year of the Great Purge, with over 9% of all prisoners dying. The average death rate after World War II was 1.8%, with the least deadly year being 1953, the final year of Stalin's rule, with a death rate of 0.33%. The average prisoner death rate during World War II was 11.3%, with the deadliest year in Gulag history being 1942, when an astonishing 17.5% of all prisoners died in a single year, almost one-fifth of the entire prison population. Around 288,000 Gulag prisoners died in the seven years recorded before World War II, 621,000 died during, and 143,000 died in the eight years after. Considering the vast difference of death rates during the Nazi invasion, an invasion where the Nazis killed 26.7 million people and perpetrated mass destruction of crops and infrastructure, and the non-invasion years, I think it's fair to say that the vast majority of those who died in the years 1941 to 1945 died more as a result of the Nazis and the Soviets. So what is the number of Gulag dead when accounting for this? Well, 41%, the percentage of the total dead who died outside of World War II, of 1.6 million total dead is 656,000. So that's 656,000 dead that the Soviet Union is responsible for. But this number is obviously too low. After all, people would still have been dying in the gulags that Hitler never came, they just would have been dying at far lower numbers. Taking the average death tolls of the years before and after World War II and applying them to the years during, you get a total of about 156,000. Giving a 1.6 times multiplier to this, the difference between recorded deaths and actual deaths, you get about 250,000, which when added to our 656,000 number, gives you about 906,000. So the Soviet Union itself is roughly responsible for a little over 900,000 gulag deaths. Quite a lot, but it's still a hell of a lot less than the 7 million gulag dead estimate the 20 million figure is predicated upon. Part B. The 1932 Famine, or Holodomor. This is something that both capitalists and communists misunderstand. I'll start with the capitalists first, because that's the whole reason I'm making this video. In high school, I, like many others I assume, learned that Joseph Stalin intentionally started a famine in Ukraine as an act of genocide, with the intention of breaking the will of Ukrainian nationalists and the peasants. The truth appears to be much more muddy. Firstly, the famine appears to have had a significant natural basis. Over 1,000 years, from the year 873 to the early 1900s, Russia experienced 120 famines, or roughly one every nine years. Mark B. Tauger, West Virginia University graduate and leading expert on famines in the early Soviet period, 
points out that Russia experienced a severe drought in 1931, cutting rainfall from 10 to 48 percent and 10 to 55 percent in the winter and spring growing seasons respectively. Not only this, but 12 percent of Ukrainian fall sown crops were destroyed by a winter kill spell in early 1932. On top of this, an extreme amount of rain in April to June of 1932 made working difficult and increased the amount of weeds and crop diseases, like wheat rust and smut, which destroyed upwards of 70% of the harvest in some regions of Ukraine and destroyed about 9 millions of tons of grain overall. Secondly, the famine appears to have affected more than just Ukraine. Almost the whole of the Soviet Union was affected, from Russia to Ukraine, from Kazakhstan to the Volga. In fact, proportionally, Kazakhstan was the hardest hit in any region of the Soviet Union, losing almost 40% of its population due to starvation or migration. Even Russia was affected, losing hundreds of thousands of peasants. Because of these factors and a lack of evidence to the contrary, the majority of modern historians no longer believe that the Soviet Union intentionally caused a famine with the intent of starving Ukraine. Princeton professor and conservative Stephen Kotkin, perhaps America's leading expert on Joseph Stalin, as well as a focal critic, explains on episode 184 of the American Interest podcast that, although he thinks Stalin has blood on his hands for the famine, he does not consider the famine to be intentional. Now, many communists use the fact that the typical conservative view of the famine, that it was entirely man-made and intentionally directed at Ukraine, is wrong as an excuse for not believing that the Soviet government has blood on its hands at all. This, I believe, is wrong. While the, Hall lol de more, do you think Stalin paid the clouds not rain? Joke may, I guess, be a decent response to someone who thinks that it was completely intentional, it's not a very good response to the average capitalist historian who knows that natural factors did play a role. Likewise, pointing out that more than just Ukraine was hit can disprove a conservative pop history view of the famine, but it is little to affect modern historians' view of the famine. Historians know that more than just Ukraine was hit. Again, 40% of Kazakhstan died, and part of the reasons why Kazakhstan was so hard hit was because of specific Soviet policy targeting Kazakhstan, as well as the Soviet policy of deporting grain from affected areas in Kazakhstan and Ukraine. Likewise, many communists will quote the historian I quoted, Mark B. Tauger, as an example of a credible and respected historian who views the famine as mostly natural, and while it is true that he does think this, it should be noted that he believes this about almost all famines, including the ones that happen under capitalist governments. He argues, for instance, that the 1943 famine in Bengal, caused largely by capitalism and Winston Churchill, was mostly due to war and weather, and he even puts scare quotes around the term man-made famine in his 2009 article, The Indian Famine Crisis of World War II. He also argues that the Irish potato famine was natural in the very same article he argues about the Soviet famine. The vast majority of the communists who quote his arguments as to why the Soviet famine was natural would probably not quote his exact same arguments for why the Bengal famine of 1943 or Irish potato famine were also natural. Just something for people to keep in mind. If you would like some good sources on the Soviet famine, I can give two. One that is sympathetic to the Soviet government, a video by the Marxist project called The Soviet Famine of 1932, An Overview, and a second one that is critical of the Soviet Union, a podcast by Sean's Russia blog called The Kazakh Famine, both linked below. Part C. The Purges. This will be a short part of the video, because the Black Book of Communism is actually close to being right about the number of people who died in the purges. The Black Book of Communism states on page 190 that, it appears that during 1937 and 1938, 1,575,000 people were arrested by the NKVD. Of these, 1.345 million received some sort of sentence, and 681,692 were executed. This is actually correct. As the study of Soviet archives makes clear, 681,692 people were executed from 1937 to 1938, the years of the Great Purge, and 799,455 were executed from 1921 to 1953, the entire Stalin era, so a little less than 800,000. Part D. The Deportations One of the last things the Soviet government did that resulted in mass deaths, and the last one we'll be focusing on today, was the internal deportation of different groups of people to different parts of the Soviet Union. These deportations usually manifested in three main subgroups. 1. The deportation of laborers and prisoners, usually related to the Gulag system. 2. The deportation of Kulaks, mostly during the 1930s. And 3. The ethnic deportations, where, for various reasons and various times, ethnic minorities would be moved from one part of the Soviet Union to the other, 
Their Germanic peoples were deported due to the fear that they would ally with the Nazis. Cossacks had their nomadic way of life ended and were brought to major cities to help industrialization, and Poles, Tatars, Uzbeks, and others were deported because a minority of them helped the Nazis. These deportations were racist, and in my mind probably the worst thing the Soviet Union ever did. Even historians sympathetic to Soviet racial policy like William M. Mandel in his book Soviet But Not Russian criticized these policies. So how many died? While it's difficult to find a consistent death toll, Wikipedia is pretty much the only thing I could find that gives overall numbers, and it differs depending on which historian you accept. Historians who use the archives estimate around 790,000 deaths, while more right-wing historians like Stephen Rosefield and Norman M. Nymark estimate between 1 and 1.5 million dead. Which estimate you accept will probably change depending on if you are sympathetic to socialism or capitalism, or more sympathetic to archives and official records. I, for one, prefer the hard evidence of the archives, because I believe it leaves a lot less to chance and misrepresentation, and therefore I accept that 790,000 estimate. But, because we are using capitalist estimates here, let's go ahead and use an average estimate of 1.15 million for all laborers, kulaks, and ethnic minorities deported. Conclusions on the Soviet section So roughly 800,000 people were killed in purges, 900,000 in the gulags, and a higher estimate of 1.15 million killed in migrations, with a possible additional 4.5 million if you include famine as Soviet made. That's a little less than 3 million killed minus the famine. It should be noted that among these numbers, there may be some overlap. For instance, some killed in the gulags in 1938 may count as being killed by the purges, and some of the labor migrants count as gulag dead, so you might not even be able to just add these numbers together. So no matter how you break it down, the Soviet Union is not responsible for anything even near 20 million deaths. But does that matter? Does it matter that Stalin executed hundreds of thousands, but not millions? Does it matter that the gulags were more brutal than the average prisons of their day, but nothing near Nazi concentration camps? Does it matter that the 1932 famine killed 3 million people or 6 million? Does it matter if the famine happened purely for political reasons or partially for natural ones? Is a difference of a death toll of a million dead, or several million dead, or tens of millions dead, really that morally significant? And the answer is, well... Maybe, kinda, it's sorta of complicated. No intelligent human being is honestly saying that because Stalin is falsely accused of killing 20 million people, that therefore killing 390,000 ethnic minorities via deportations is no longer bad. The fact that many capitalists greatly exaggerate the gulags does not mean that working hundreds of thousands of prisoners to death is not wrong. Inversely, though, the difference between the accused 20 million dead figure for Stalin the more likely 3 million, is a difference of 17 million. That's a Holocaust and three Armenian genocides worth of a difference. That's a World War I and three Rwandan genocides worth of a difference. That's an over 5,600 9-11s worth of a difference. To say that killing 20 million is no worse than killing 3 million is to say that those additional 17 million hypothetical deaths would have no additional moral value. And honestly, even conservatives understand this point. If there is no moral difference between killing 20 million and killing 3 million, then why quote the 20 million estimate? If the 20 million estimate has far less evidence, why do you quote that instead of the far more historically backed 3 million estimate? Well, the reason why they quote the 20 million estimate is because it looks a lot worse than 3 million. The fact that they opt for the 20 million number shows that even they themselves recognize some form of a difference. Here's a good example. When Matthew White published his book, Atrocities, a book categorizing the 100 worst mass killings in human history, he gave a very high estimate for Stalin of 20 million dead. In response to this, right-wing libertarian historian R.J. Rummel, a very crazy person, estimated 61 million killed in the Soviet Union. He dismissed Mr. White's numbers as not reliable, adding that it mattered greatly whether Stalin killed 20 million, Mr. White's figure, or 61 million, his own figure, saying, when the magnitude is so great, it is a profound statement on the nature of communism. And that's just it. It's not there is a profound moral difference between killing 3 million and 20 million. There's not. It's that these estimates will be judged differently in the eyes of history. History, unfortunately, is littered with things that have killed around 3 million people. The Vietnam, Korean, Napoleonic, Sudanese, Congo, Fengla, and 100 Years Wars all killed around 3 million people, as did the Crusades, the French Wars of Religion, and the reigns of Peter the Great, Suharto, and others. Dozens of things from dozens of ideologies have been used to justify 3 million deaths. 
but how many things have killed about 20 million people? Well, significantly less. The Native American genocide, the transatlantic and Arabic slave trades, the Taiping Rebellion, and a few Chinese dynasties collapsing. Significantly less ideologies have been used to kill 20 million people. Now how many things have killed a similar amount to R.J. Rummel's estimate of 61 million Soviet dead? Well, even less. Only World War II and the high estimates of Mao and British India really compare. That is the real reason these numbers matter. If Stalin killed 3 million, then he did an evil thing that has many parallels throughout all of human history. But if he killed 61 million, or even 20 million, then he is an epoch-defining evil with few if any equals. This is where the big difference lies, and why they quote these exaggerated estimates. Part 2. Mao's China Of this book's 94 million death estimate for communism, about 70%, or 65 million deaths, is said to have happened in Mao's China. The book breaks this down with 20 to 43 million deaths as a result of the Great Leap Forward on page 495, 20 million deaths in the Laogai prison camps on page 498, between 400,000 and 3 million killed during the Chinese Cultural Revolution on page 513, and 800,000 killed during the Chinese invasion of Tibet on page 546, making anywhere between 41.2 and 66.8 million dead in total. Now, my response to this is going to be a little different to my response to the Soviet Union's supposed death toll, mainly that I was able to give more or less specific examples for death tolls when it came to the Soviet Union. This is because the collapse of the Soviet Union granted access to its archives and allows us to have much better estimates. But China has not collapsed, and given its rate of economic growth, it's unlikely to collapse anytime soon. As a result of this, I'll not be able to respond to a claim with an exact estimate like I was with the Gulags, saying how they killed 1,053,000 people and not 7 million. So instead, most of this section will be spent discrediting the numbers the Black Book does bring up, rather than offering up any of my own. Also, because the vast, vast majority of Mao's supposed death toll comes from the Great Leap Forward in the Laogai camps, for brevity's sake, I'm going to focus on these two exclusively. Part A. The Great Leap Forward the Black Book of Communism claims on page 495 that between 20 and 43 million people died of starvation during the Great Chinese Famine of 1959. Their source for this is the book Hungry Ghosts, Mao's Secret Famine by historian Jasper Becker. He writes from page 270 to page 274 on the book that between 20 and 40 million people died. One of the main problems with this number, which is a number that other copulists quote as well, is that it includes falling birth rates as deaths. This is something even Hungry Ghost itself admits, on page 271. Articles published by some experts in China and by exiled dissidents claim that the death toll is far higher even than Bannister's estimate. In 1993, a Chinese scholar published an article in the Shanghai Academic Journal Society, which was later withdrawn. The author looked at inconsistencies in official statistics on birth and death rates, sex ratios, rural and urban populations, and provincial and national figures, and concluded that the figures must have been falsified to hide a death toll of at least 40 million. Unfortunately, it is also true that Chinese statistics about any subject are rarely internally consistent, so it is hard to know how significant these discrepancies are. Whether or not this figure of 40 million is to be trusted, it is now used, almost casually, by various authors inside China who lump deaths and reduction of births together. Another book, Disasters of Leftism in China by Wen Yu, published in 1993, claims that, from 1959 to 1961, the abnormal deaths plus the reduction of births reached together an estimate of more than 40 million with direct economic losses of 120 million yuan. The problem with this is that a reduction in birth is not the equivalent of already existing, living, breathing people dying. You can't just count people not being born as people being actively killed. Another problem the Black Book has in this section is misquoting its own sources. On page 492, the Black Book came to the death rate of the Anhui province, quote, soared to 68% from its normal level of around 15%. The source for this is The Origins of the Culture Revolution, Volume 3 by Roderick McFarquhar. However, McFarquhar actually estimates on page 8 of his book a death rate of 68.58 out of 1,000. 68 out of 1,000 is 6.8%, not 68%, making the Black Book wrong by a factor of 10. This chapter is where the remedial math errors that Harvard talked about really start to shine. For further proof that the Black Book and its sources numbers are unreliable, let's turn again to page 474 of Hungry Ghosts. If we look at Mao's famine as a deliberate act of inhumanity, 
then his record can also be measured against that of Hitler and Stalin. Some 12 million died in the Nazi concentration camps, and a further 30 million were killed during the Second World War. Stalin is thought to have allowed 20 million to die in the gulags, and overall he is believed to have been responsible for between 30 and 40 million deaths. This 20 million dead in gulags number is an absurd overestimate. As we have already covered, the total number of people even imprisoned in the gulags was 18 million, and that includes repeat offenders, meaning many of those 18 million were the same people serving at different times. In order for Stalin to have killed 20 million people in the gulags, he would have had to kill every single person who ever set foot in a gulag, bring millions back to life, and then kill them again. And this is just talking about the number of prisoners overall. The high estimate for the number of gulag dead is 1.7 million, over 10 times lower than this book's estimate. Considering this book is wrong by tens of millions on things we were able to fact check, considering we have access to the Soviet archives, I don't find it unreasonable to believe that it is also probably wrong on things we don't have access for. The Black Book makes yet another historical error on page 495 when it says that the second worst famine in history occurred in northern China in 1877 to 1878 and had taken between 9 million and 13 million lives. Hungry Ghosts, the Black Book's main source for this chapter, says this as well on page 273. Both the Black Book and Hungry Ghosts are wrong about this. The Great Chinese Famine of 1907, for instance, killed 25 million people. Page 69 on the Encyclopedia of Disaster Relief says, The Chinese Famine of 1907 is the second worst famine in recorded human history, with an estimated death toll of around 25 million people. This exceeds the lowest estimates for the death toll of the later Great Chinese Famine, meaning that the 1907 famine could actually be the worst in all of history. We'll talk more about this famine when we discuss the death toll of capitalism, but for now, let's go back to the Great Leap Forward Famine. So what caused it? Well, like the Soviet famine of 1932, the answers are complex. Researchers have found that between the year 108 BC and the year 1928, that China experienced 1,828 famines, basically a famine every year. The vast majority of these were a mixture of natural events and political circumstances, like a dynastic dispute. The Great Chinese Famine appears to be no different. In 1959, the Yellow River flooded in East China. This is important because the flooding of the Yellow River is one of the main causes of famine and death in Chinese history. The Chinese famines of 1775, 1887, 1931, 1928, and 1935, for instance, were all caused to one extent or another by the flooding of the Yellow River. This wasn't the only natural disaster to strike China during its Great Leap. China also experienced massive amounts of crop rust and a rise in pests. As a result of all this, grain production in China fell from over 195 million tons in 1957 to just over 143 million tons, a loss of over 50 million tons of grain. Now, like with all famines, there were of course political causes, both from within and with outside China. From outside, both the United States and the Soviet Union played a role. The United States, for its part, bombed and sanctioned China for years with the goal of breaking it economically. Quoting page 272 of War and Revolution by Domenico Lesudro, quote, China under communist rule became the target of American military threats and economic warfare. The Truman administration pursued an objective clarified by a U.S. author who sympathetically describes the prominent role played by the Cold War by Washington policy of encirclement and economic strangulation of the People's Republic. The later must be plagued by a general standard of living around and below subsistence level. A country in desperate need must be induced into a catastrophic economic situation towards disaster and collapse. In the early 1960s, a collaborator in the Kennedy administration, W.W. W. Rostow, boasted of the victory secured by the USA, which has succeeded in retarding China's economic development by at least tens of years. The Soviets, for their part, broke up with China during the Sino-Soviet split, depriving China of their biggest economic partner and possible relief giver. And of course, there are political circumstances within China itself that they are responsible for. They, like in the Soviet Union, ignored the early signs of famine, deported food from stricken areas, and prevented the free movement of people, exacerbating the famine. But none of this is as clear-cut and dry as China starved tens of millions of its own people to death. Part B. The Laogai Camp System the Black Book of Communism estimates that 20 million people died in what were called the Laogai camps, or basically the Chinese gulags. Page 498 of the Black Book states that 50 million people were sent to the Laogai camps, that 10 million people a year were detained, 
and that 5% of all detainees died. We'll start with the 50 million estimate. This estimate comes from Laogai prisoner Harry Wu. Harry is essentially the Chinese Alexander Solzhenitsyn, and like Solzhenitsyn, his estimates leave a lot to be desired. The estimate comes from his 1992 book, Laogai. In the section titled, The Population of Labor Reform Camps, he says that at least 50 million people have been sentenced to hard labor camps, and moreover, at present 16 to 20 million are still confined in these camps. However, this 16 to 20 million still confined estimate is bogus. Prisonstudies.org estimates that in 1992, the year Harry's book was published, the overall prison population of China was 1,276,517, or less than one-tenth of Harry's estimate. So Harry Wu was wrong by a factor of 10. Again, considering he's wrong about things that we can fact-check, I don't think we can be trusted on things that we can't. The second claim, the one that 10 million people were detained each year, is also refuted by this. Although it is likely that prison population was higher under Mao, it's not likely that it was 10 times higher. The last pillar of his argument, that 5% of prisoners died, may be unfounded, as far as I can tell, but is not strained credulity. An around 5% death rate is similar to that of the early gulags, so it might not be far off. Taking our inability to have an actual estimate for the number of prisoners, or the death rate of those prisoners, I see no reason to accept the Black Book estimate of 20 million dead. Part 3. Capitalism's Death Toll Now that we've covered how many people did and didn't die under communism, let's talk about how many people have actually died under capitalism. We've already shown that the 100 million number is an absurd estimate, but hey, let's, for the sake of argument, grant conservatives that number. The Black Book is not cherry-picked, it does not contain countless historical inaccuracies, it does not contain remedial math errors, it is not rejected by its own authors, it is 100% right about 100 million people dying under communism. 100% right. Okay, fine. So how many people has capitalism killed? Capitalism first began in Italian city-states, and then over time took hold in both Britain and the Netherlands. It was capitalism entanglement with Britain and the other European powers that had spread throughout the world through colonialism. Through the British Empire, capitalism was introduced to India, to Australia, to the US, and others. From France, Algeria was introduced to capitalism, as well as Vietnam, Canada, and others. So modern global capitalism is a direct result of imperialism. In my next video on whether or not the Nazis were socialist, I'll get more into the connections between capitalism and imperialism, but for now, this'll do. The first of the imperialist mass deaths we'll be talking about today is the colonization of India. Before the British invasion, famines did of course exist in India, however, they were rarer and usually produced much smaller death tolls. This is because the massive grain stockpiling dissemination systems built by the Mughal Empire. After the British invasions, these were done away with, and the grain was sent in larger quantities as possible to Britain itself to maximize profits. This is why, during the same time period India was suffering the worst series of famines in human history, Britain abolished its own famine cycle. The first of these famines was the Great Bengal Famine of 1770, in which 10 million people, about a third of Bengal's population, died. This famine was a mixture of natural disaster and the policies of the East India Trading Company. The famine began due to a lack of rainfall, but was greatly exacerbated by British policies. For one, virtually all of the grain and rice reserves were shipped off to Britain. The second was that East India Trade Company policy of massively increasing taxes in order to cover its losses. These taxes, sometimes collected violently, pushed the population deeper into poverty, making them unable to buy what little food there was. The second of these famines was the 1783 Chelsea Famine, which killed 11 million people, about the same number as the Holocaust. The third famine occurred in India in 1791 and killed an additional 11 million people. So many people died that their bodies could no longer be burned or buried, and their bodies would simply lie around decomposing, and so the famine would become known as the Doji Bara, or Skull Famine. Now it should be noted that if you take the combined death toll of just these three famines alone, that being 32 million, and account for the population differences of when these famines took place, the late 1700s when the world population was less than a billion, and the area where communism is said to have done the majority of its killings, the 1960s, where the world population was over 3 billion, then these three famines alone killed approximately 96 million people, more than the Black Book of Communism's estimates for the entirety of communism. But maybe you think it's unfair to compare them proportionally. Fair enough? Let's continue. From 1837 to 1947, India would experience many more famines, killing many millions more people. Famines like the Agra, Orissa, and Rajputana famines, probably mispronouncing those, 
killed 800,000, 1 million, and 1.5 million people respectively. But the famine I really want to talk about here is the Bihar Famine of 1873, mainly because it never actually happened. You see, in 1873, a drought hit the northeast provinces of Bengal and Bihar, threatening millions of peasants with starvation. In response to this, the man put in charge of famine relief in that region, Sir Richard Temple, imported half a million tons of rice from Burma and distributed it freely to the peasants. As a result of this, the famine only killed 23 people, instead of the projected millions. As a result, Temple was criticized back in Britain for unnecessary expenditures, interfering in the market, and creating welfare dependency. The Economist, yes, that Economist, even criticized him for teaching Indians that is, the duty of the government to keep them alive. As a result of this, Temple vowed to cut welfare expenditure and stay within budget. As a result of this, when the monsoons failed to arrive in 1876, Temple responded very modestly, refusing to do much government expenditure and firing over half a million aid workers, resulting in one of the deadliest famines in India's history, killing 5.5 million people in what today has become known as the Great Famine of 1876. I bring this up as an example of the British having the power to end these famines, but choosing not to because they believe that doing so would be interfering in the free market and be cost ineffective. Another good example of this free market capitalism gone wrong was in Ireland during the Great Potato Famine. The British actually spent more on compensating slave owners for freeing their slaves than on famine relief in Ireland. The Irish History Podcast has a great episode about this, but the British themselves were actually able to significantly lower the effects of the famine in the early years. However, the British became concerned about welfare dependency and cut Irish benefits to the bone, killing or forcing to flee one quarter of the entire population. Around this same time, Britain and France were going to war with China over opium. Starting in the 1800s, the East India Trading Company began smuggling Indian opium into China, causing widespread addiction. China responded to this by stamping down on illegal smugglers, prompting Britain to go to war with China and force them to sign treaties allowing unmolested Chinese openness to British opium markets. This caused widespread addiction. Of the 300 million Chinese people alive in the late 19th century, over 90 million were addicted to opium. As you could imagine, having one-third of your country addicted to one of history's deadliest and most addictive drugs caused widespread poverty, death, and violence. The Taiping Rebellion, the deadliest civil war in history, that killed 20 million people, was started largely in response to the opium trade. An unknowable number of likely millions died directly, and to this day Chinese people are genetically predisposed to drug addiction. But we're not here to talk about all those civil war and overdose deaths, although capitalism did play a role in these. We're here to talk about the famines that ensued. Now, as I've already pointed out, China has experienced famine for thousands of years. However, like with India, the severity of these famines drastically increased under British influence, with China's long history of grain reserves and famine relief being disrupted by natural disasters, civil war, and imperialist pressure. The first of these major famines struck in 1876 and killed between 9.5 and 13 million people. This famine, the Great Northern Chinese Famine, was started by a drought and was exacerbated by politics namely farmland being used to grow opium for British markets. Another large famine, arguably the largest in the history of the world, the Great Chinese Famine of 1907, killed 25 million people. This famine was caused by a mixture of political instability brought on by British invasion and dynastic decay, along with the opium trade. When you add up all the famines that happened under British occupation of India and post-opium war China, you end up with a low estimate of around 50 million dead in India and 40 million dead in China, so with these two alone, capitalism has a much larger history of famine than socialism does, both by duration and number killed. Now one might argue that these famines were not caused purely by capitalism, and you would be correct. They were natural events greatly exacerbated by their political and economic circumstances. Now you could also argue the same is true for the famines that happened under socialist governments, and again you would be correct. But here in my mind are the differences. The Soviet Union and China both had one major famine as a direct result of their government policies while British Ireland, India, and post-opium war China would have these famines on and on again for generations. While the Soviet Union and China both had major famines, they then got over them and went on to massively increase food production. In the Soviet Union, for instance, people ate a comparable amount to people in the United States in the 1950s, while Mao increased the population of China from 540 million in 1949 to 930 million by 1976, almost double. He also increased life expectancy from 36 years in 1949 to 64 years in 1976, again almost double. It may sound weird to hear, 
but by almost doubling life expectancy and population in the world's most populous country, Mao is probably responsible for the greatest increase of human life of any leader in human history. Now compare this to the famines in Ireland, India, and China, which would occur again and again and again for hundreds of years, with the British government showing that they had the ability to end these famines, as shown during their response to the potato famine and the Bihar famine of 1873, but actively chose not to, so as not to interfere with what they saw as small government and laissez-faire economics. The famines were horrible under both the capitalists and the socialists, even as the socialists can't really find a way to justify the Soviet or Chinese response to their famines, but the capitalist famines killed considerably more over a considerably larger amount of time. But maybe you don't think famines should be counted the same as executions or forced labor deaths. Fine. So let's deal with the famines aside for right now and deal with the more direct deaths. In 1885, Belgium would declare the founding of the Congo Free State. Much like the British East India Trade Company and the Hudson's Bay Company before it, the Congo Free State would function both as a private capitalist corporation and a colonial state simultaneously. In order to keep up with the rising demand for rubber, the Congo Free State would use brutal methods in order to force the indigenous population to complacency. Whippings, beatings, and killings became common. The Congo Free State got so brutal in order to keep up with demand that black people's severed body parts became a crude form of currency, as Matthew White explains here. When corporate security guards were sent on punitive raids, they were told not to waste ammunition. One bullet, one kill. They were not supposed to use company ammunition hunting big game for sport. As proof of their frugality, they are expected to bring back one severed human hand for every bullet expended. Severed hands became a form of currency, proof that orders were being obeyed. A basket of smoked hands covered any shortfall in production, and if there were no rubber to be had, the Free State Security Forces, the Force Publique, would go out to collect a quarter of hands instead. Natives quickly learned that willingly sacrificing a hand might save a life. And not just hands. After one commander grumbled that his men were shooting only women and children, the soldiers returned from the next raid with a basket of penises. The Congo Free State was perhaps the most brutal regime in modern human history, killing at least 10 million Congolese people out of a population of only 20 million. That's half the population. That's significantly worse than any socialist state in history, even if you go by capitalist estimates. And it's not the only capitalist state to kill a greater than Pol Pot slice out of a population. The American-backed invasion of East Timor killed one-third of the population. The Cromwellian conquest of Ireland killed one-third of the population. The American movement west into native territory killed a sizable majority of a dozen native nations in search of expanding private property and land. These are not just things that capitalist nations did. These are things that capitalist nations did for explicitly capitalist reasons, and they are all far deadlier than even the most strident opponent of communism can say Stalin and Mao were. So what about purges? One of communism's worst crimes, according to the Black Book, is the persecution and mass killing of political dissidents. Certainly, capitalist governments have never had a purge on the same level of Stalin's Soviet Union or Mao's China, right? Well, in 1965, American-backed Indonesian dictator Suharto would instigate one of the largest purges in human history. Before the purge, India had one of the largest communist movements in the world, with millions of communists living throughout the country. After the purge, Indonesia would be one of the most right-wing countries on Earth. Death tolls vary, with estimates going as low as half a million to as high as three million. For his part, Han Waliendo? Again, probably mispronouncing that. One of Suharto's confidants, estimated to about 1.2 million. This makes it larger than all of Stalin's purges put together, which we have already covered is about 800,000. When you add up all the capitalist death tolls, 50 to 60 million Indians, 40 million Chinese, 10 million Congolese, 1.5 million Irish, and 1.2 million Indonesians, you end up with over 107 million dead from capitalism, several million more than even the Black Book's death toll for communism. And this isn't even a complete death toll for capitalism. It doesn't include capitalism's role in the slave trade, Manifest Destiny, America's invasion of communist countries during the Cold War, sanctions, austerity, or one of the other dozens of invasions in the Third World for private profit. So, at the end of the day, no. Communism has not killed 100 million people. But capitalism sure has. Thank you for watching. This video took a long time to make, so I would greatly appreciate if you would spread it around to people when you hear them using the 100 million argument. The next video should be out in a few months. Have a great day.